Welcome to Discover Ag, where every week we discover what's new in the world of agriculture. We're your hosts, Natalie Kaborik, a rancher from Nebraska. And Tara Vanderdusen, a dairy farmer from New Mexico. And together we bring you our professional farming opinions on a variety of trending topics in the ag and food space so that you can better understand our food system and feel connected to the hands that feed us. And today we are back with episode 85 of Discover Ag, and this episode is brought to you by Merck Animal Health. In this industry, your name is everything. It's the legacy you fight to live up to, work to leave behind. Merck Animal Health has 50 plus year history of providing the products that cattle need to stay healthy and that producers need to stay sustainable. With innovation, passion, and integrity, Merck will do what's right for you and your operation. This is why Merck Animal Health works. Visit mahcattle.com to see how Merck Animal Health can work for you. That is mahcattle.com. The link is in our show notes. Good morning, you guys, or maybe afternoon or evening, whenever. Uh, But we are so excited for today's episode. This is an interview that Tara and I have been wanting to do, honestly, for a really long time. We have seen the need to bring a professional on to speak to the facts of antibiotics and cattle. Um, Gosh, Tara, I feel like we've been talking about this since like November, December when we (laughs) rebranded. And then recently with everything that's been going on in the news, I don't know if everyone tuning in has seen it, but there is a lot out there right now about the mRNA vaccine. And so Tara and I like, okay, now is the time we have got to get someone on to kind of set the record straight get a professional opinion about this and really just deep dive antibiotics and vaccines in the beef industry. So that is what we are doing today. We have with us Dr. Dave. Dr. Dave is a technical services veterinarian for Merck Animal Health. He is a 1994 graduate of Kansas State University's College of Vet Medicine. Before joining Merck Animal Health, he devoted the majority of his career to beef production medicine by serving as a feed yard consultant and staff veterinarian for cattle feeding operations in the High Plains. He currently serves as vice president on the board of directors for the American Association of Bovine Practitioners. Welcome, Dr. Dave. We are truly so honored and excited to have you here today. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. So I think that maybe it'd be best if we separated this conversation into kind of two sections. And the first being antibiotics in cattle and the beef industry, as Natalie mentioned, and then end kind of with vaccinations, specifically, you know, the one that's making headlines, the mRNA for the second half. So thinking about starting with antibiotics, I think what I want to know is kind of like big picture, how antibiotics are used in the industry, um, staying within, you know, beef and dairy. We haven't said dairy, but, you know, within cattle as a whole, what is the big picture of antibiotics? Well, of course, antibiotics are the, on the broad scope of things is simply we use antibiotics to treat uh, sickness. And of course, we have to keep in mind that uh, antibiotics work on bacteria only. They have no effect on, on viruses, but, um, how they're used is, you know, we see an animal that's, uh, sick, whether it's uh, respiratory disease or lameness or a uterine infection, whatever it would happen to be. And then we use antibiotics to, uh, to treat that disease. Um, there are antibiotics that are labeled for, uh, for instance, uh, BRD control, bovine respiratory disease control. And that occurs when you have a, a set of, of, of calves that, that might come into a feed yard or a stalker operation or just a severe weather event that, uh, that hits a, a, a bunch of cattle. But uh, uh, you're, you're concerned that uh, there, are, there are some cattle that are coming down with bovine respiratory disease and you're very concerned that the rest of the group might also come down with it by virtue of the fact that they've just come in on a semi or again, a severe weather event. And, uh, and so you can, uh, essentially treat the whole group. Uh, and that's what the, the, uh, BRD control label is for. So one of the good things I think about antibiotics in the industry, and one of the bad things I think about antibiotics in the industry is that it is similar to antibiotics in humans, right? So when you started this off, you kind of explained exactly how we would think of it within humans. You know, it is a medicine used to treat bacteria. Um, you know, when you're sick, you go to the doctor, you get a medicine, you take it, you treat it. And it that's very similar to how I think of it within the beef industry, right? 
same thing. We're treating symptoms. It's prescribed by a veterinarian in this case, not a doctor, but very, you know, similar for people who are not involved in agriculture. But I think that's also a problem because I think some of the confusion, and maybe this is where I want to start, you know, diving in on a more detailed conversation about antibiotics and kind of a misconception is this overlap between humans and animals. Um, I think there's a big fear out there that, you know, super resistance or whatever you want to call it, you know, the treating, it's going to overlap and affect the human pharmaceutical system. And I kind of want to dive into that because, you know, we are the students in this conversation, Dr. Dave, so you can very much so correct me, please do. But, you know, from my understanding, there are few classes that truly overlap between human antibiotics and cattle antibiotics. You know, what we are using for human health is going to be very different than what we're using for cattle health. So again, when we look at that misconception where people are afraid of, you know, overtreating in cattle, they're building up resistance and then it's going to affect human population. That is not as much of a concern just because of the minimal overlap. So let's dive into that. Yeah. So there are some antibiotics uh, that are called medically important antibiotics that do overlap between uh, human and, and animal medicine. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I guess I, I see it as a, there is a concern um, that uh, primarily on the human side of, uh, of overuse. Uh, and I say that kind of loosely, it, it, the, the beef industry, uh, I think has done an excellent job of trying to address this. I think livestock production in general has done an excellent job in attempting to address this. But we all hear the uh, the comment that 80% of uh, antibiotics used in the U.S. are are used in in animals, and uh, and that quite frankly is true. It's it's that's a pretty accurate number. We've tried to refute that in the past, but the fact of the matter is. When we look at the body mass of all the livestock in the U.S., uh, you know, uh, an adult uh, feedlot steer is sometimes seven times what would account for the body mass of seven people. And then you've got uh, everything down to billions, literally billions of chickens raised in the U.S. So you, you, when you include the, the, the cattle, the hogs, the sheep, um, turkeys, chickens, et cetera, if you add all that body mass up, um, it's actually uh, as much or more than the human body mass in the United States. So when we, when we look at it in, in those parameters, uh, we're actually even with, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the body mass of all those livestock are uh, actually come out to about, eight, <laughs> I'm not saying this very well. The body mass okay. of the livestock, the body mass of livestock and humans combined, um, the the livestock body mass makes up eighty percent of that total, and so eighty percent of the total is using eighty percent of the antibiotics. It it kind of stands to reason, and that figure doesn't include uh, our companion animals. So when we throw that in there, um, if if we want to compare um, animal health to human health, uh, we're on par. And uh, so the issue that we have with uh, antimicrobial resistance in humans coming from livestock, um, there's, not a, there's not a good scientific link to that. Um, there are, I've read some individual reports, quite frankly, that I think are very weak, that, uh, that those are just uh, spot cases rather than a true epidemiological look. And so I think the big point there is that we have to understand that um, con controlling and trying to abide by uh, judicious use of antimicrobials not, is not just animal agriculture's issue. It's an issue across animal agriculture and uh, human medicine. And and the quicker we understand that, the, the quicker that we can all come to a resolution of it, or at least uh, control it better. Yeah, I have never in all the years of conversations heard it explained that way about the body weight. Like maybe I've been living under a rock, but that's so helpful to hear or 
to relate it that like by body weight were con- like it's pretty comparable um and i think i like your last point about that this is a problem for everyone this isn't just on animal ag this is on all of us like i know as a mom like relating it back to you know your kids i don't know how many times i've taken my children to the doctor and the doctor is like i you know i'm not sure if it's viral or bacterial they seem like they're getting worse and obviously you don't want your kid to be sick and they ultimately prescribe antibiotics like and i you know knowing what I know, I tried to be like, okay, you know what? We're actually going to hold out a few more days, see if it keeps getting worse or see if we kick it, if it's a virus. Like, I do think we all have to take a proactive approach to not just being like, well, we're not sure, like just antibiotics, you know, like, and it is the greater population that needs to take responsibility for this. Yeah. And that's, that, that's an excellent point. I, I'm, I'm a grandfather now. So, uh, uh, but when my kids were young, it was, it was pretty common that, uh, uh, when we take them in for a respiratory infection or something like that, um, that they get an that they would get an antibiotic, and uh, and now credit to the human medical profession, uh, it's that's less likely to happen. Uh, my grandkids don't always get an antibiotic if the physician believes that it or can show that it is a a viral infection as opposed to a bacterial infection. And that that uh, that can be frustrating to some uh, parents, and and a lot of times, um, I, I was convinced when I would see uh, when my kids were young, when I would see our physician prescribe them an antibiotic, and and I was fairly certain it was viral. I had a little bit of uh, health knowledge, and so when I would see it was viral, I would I would say, well, you know, okay, we'll give the antibiotic, but um, you're, you're treating us. You're treating the parents. You're not really treating the infection. Uh, you're trying to appease us. And uh, so that conversation is being had more and more on the med- on the human medical side. And on the animal medical side, you know, I am a big fan. You know, I, I now work for a, ph- a company that produces antibiotics. But uh, there's so many things that we can do management-wise to prevent our use of, of antibiotics, uh, vaccinations, good animal husbandry, those sorts of things. And <clears throat> by virtue of that, uh, if, if we can reduce our antibiotic use, and, uh, when, and when I say that, I want, you, I want us to keep in mind that uh, antibiotic resistance doesn't necessarily come from antibiotic misuse. It comes from antibiotic use. Anytime we use an antibiotic, we are, whether it, if it's for the right, even if it's for the right purposes, uh, we are potentially uh, opening the door for antimicrobial resistance. So again, we have to be careful. We have to do whatever, everything we can to tr- try to prevent our livestock from getting uh, in a, a bacterial infection. And, and again, management first, then we go to medicine. Yeah, I think that's so well said. And I, again, going back to kind of my opening statement that the good and bad thing is that it is, we can kind of think of it on the you know same wavelength. You know, Tara, you brought up that that's how you approach treatment with your kids. And for everyone listening who's outside of the you know industry, that is how as a rancher, we approach a sick calf, you know, the same way, like we'll be out at pasture and in the ranger and, you know, we'll see a calf we maybe think is sick and Luke will assess if he thinks it's viral or not, you know, whether we truly have to give the antibiotic or not. And so it's kind of that same judgment, that same conversation that we're having. We're not out there as producers, just, you know, using all the time. We take in that same sense of judgment of whether we think this is a viral infection or whether this is a bacterial and we should in fact treat the calf. Yeah. No, and I, I think, yeah, it's an excellent point. And, and, and sometimes, you know, it's very difficult, you know, if, if we're not sure if it's viral or bacterial, and it can't, it, many times it can be uh, very difficult to tell the difference. Uh, you know, we've kind of got a safety up and, and use that antibiotic in some places that we may, um, might not be the best instance, but if we waited for a bacterial culture to come back from the lab, uh, that animal would probably be dead before we got that, those results. And so um, there's that type of approach going on, not only in, in veterinary medicine, but also in, in human medicine. And I think, uh, I don't think that's a bad approach. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't think that's a 
that approach at all. It's, you know, it's the welfare of the livestock. We can't, um, we can't withhold treatment, uh, from a, just from a welfare perspective, we can't withhold treatment, uh, and wait. Uh, that's, that, that's very poor animal welfare. So I think that actually teases up really well to kind of jump into the next conversation I want to have, which is this, I don't know if it's a narrative or an idea or really what to call it, but this idea that, you know, as a consumer, they want meat with no antibiotics. And I think what that means then is it correlates back to maybe a ranch that isn't giving antibiotics. And so I want to have, I guess, maybe a conversation around, um, like you already kind of highlighted the importance of using them, why we'd use them, animal welfare, obviously talk about, you know, the withdrawal period in that and kind of just, I guess, maybe move into what it looks like, you know, for the no antibiotics in meat kind of conversation. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, um, there are, for instance, some poultry operations that have gone antibiotic free and, uh, and, and credit to them. I mean, that, that, and what that boils down to, frankly, is, is good management on their part. Um, part of the reason why that is successful is because those animals simply don't live very long. It's a, uh, it's a very short lifespan for a, a broiler chicken talking a matter of, uh, of weeks, um, in, uh, uh, from essentially hatching to maturity They're they, they grow really fast. And so, uh, the opportunities for them to get a bacterial f- infection are are lower and so it's it's probably a little easier and and some of the confinement systems they have they can control that environment much better but uh when it comes to beef and dairy we're we're talking about an uh, outdoor system uh, and um, it's uh, it's a segmented industry and so by virtue of that we have uh, a lot of exposure to uh, to pathogens and, and and we don't have the the the, the true confinement. Uh, we we have we take cattle to a, a livestock auction, take them off the ranch, put them into a livestock auction where they're co-mingled with other cattle. Um, if it's if they're an uh, order buyer is purchasing those cattle for a feed yard in in the high plains area, for instance, why? Uh, those cattle are, are a lot of times taken from the livestock auction to a collection center that that order buyer has, where they're uh, mixed and co-mingled with even with cattle from other livestock auctions. Then they're sorted for size and and uh, and then finally shipped out to the feed yard. And a lot of these calves, a lot of times, have had uh, they were uh, say weaned on the trailer on Monday morning, and by Wednesday afternoon. Uh, they are out of Mississippi and they're in Western Kansas and, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a jolt to their lifestyle. And that's something that as an industry, we need to look at ways that we can, uh, address that to make it less stressful, uh, make sure that we are getting these calves vaccinated and preconditioned. And that isn't always, uh, cost effective for a lot of producers when you, when you've only got five to 20 head of cows, it's, it's difficult to wean those calves and keep them around the place for 60 days. You've got to invest in, in uh, some sort of a, a pen system to, uh, to keep the calves and cows separated. So they're actually weaned. Um, you've got to invest in equipment to feed the calves, both, uh, like for instance, feed bunks and, and, uh, a feed wagon or, uh, feed truck, those kinds of things to, uh, to get them fed. And, and, uh, so there's a lot of producers out there and I, I wouldn't, I'm not trying to deter anyone from owning cattle if they want to own cattle, <laughs> but, uh, it's, my uh, husband will deter people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I don't blame them, but it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, if you want to own livestock, you ought to be allowed to own livestock. You know what I mean? And, uh, but, um, uh, I think the people that, that do, uh, wean on the trailer and just have a few calves and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, they need, they need to consider, um, uh, the impact that those calves have on the rest of the industry. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's kind of like some of these animal welfare videos that, uh, go out, you know, it's, it's a lot of times just individual animals, but it makes the, 
uh, it gives the entire industry a black eye. So there's a couple of things I want to highlight there. Um, first off, at the very beginning, you talked about the chickens and how they're in a more controlled environment. And so that leads to maybe um, less of a barrier to going, you know, antibiotic free, essentially mm-hmm. helps. And I love that you brought that in the conversation because Tara and I, if there's anything Discover Ag stands for, it's nuance in conversation. And I thought you so well gave an example of how for everyone who, you know, wants no antibiotic in meat, but on the same, um, I guess, same hand wants, you know, is anti-CAFO or anti-controlled environments or anti-industrialized. It's kind of like, well, there's the, again, there's that nuance in the conversation that one of the pros to maybe having that more controlled environment is you get to be antibiotic free then, you know, whereas again, someone who's maybe wants that grass fed and, you know, cow out on pasture and is a proponent for that. Well, there's a lot more variables there, you know, then that's where maybe the antibiotics need to come in. So again, it's just not so black and white as everyone wants to make it. It's more of that, you know, complex nuanced conversation. And then the other thing I just want to clear up for everyone who's maybe listening outside of the industry Um, you know, Dr. Dave talked about, you know, basically the changing of hands when it comes to cattle. And if people aren't familiar, um, the average ownership changes about five times before, you know, from pasture to plate for a beef cow, which is again, very different when we look at like other animal proteins. And so in that, uh, transfer of ownership, those five different, again, that's an average, but there are those high stress periods of times. And so for anyone who's just kind of wondering, you know, why there's all that exchange going on, it's the beef industry is just a little bit different than um, some of the other animal proteins. Yeah, indeed. I mean, that's, uh, I think, I don't think, I think it's safe to say that uh, the beef industry is the most segmented industry of, of all the protein production. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, pork production, for example, uh, it, a lot of uh, most of the p- pigs anymore they're on very large uh total confinement hog farms that uh they're farrowed uh on the same uh acreage as uh as they are fattened and uh and that just generally is not true in the beef industry uh, you know these, these calves spend the bulk of their lives on pasture and then they're sent to the feed yard and uh it i mean there may be a, a stalker stage or a backgrounder stage in there so you've got the cow calf stage and the stalker and backgrounder and then uh eventually get to the feed yard and then of course then to the to the packing plant and so uh again as you said there there may be as many as uh as five ownership changes for those cattle in in their life and you know, this is where uh, vaccines become so important, uh, preconditioning these calves before uh, they leave the farm of origin. And like I said earlier, on those smaller operations, it's very difficult for uh, uh, someone to uh, to have to put in that capital investment to truly precondition these cattle. And, and for me, a true preconditioning program includes uh, two rounds of, of modified live vaccines, a, a, a clostridial, uh, and that's that's a, a bare minimum of, of vaccinations. And, and But to me, they have to be weaned for 60 days and, uh, uh, and understand what a feed bunk is and what a water tank is. I did part of my growing up in, in Missouri and, you know, and there uh, there's farm ponds all over the place. And those calves, I know when they go into a feed yard, they don't recognize what, what a water tank is. And if they've been on a truck for 12 plus hours, um, they're thirsty and they walk into a pen and there's this beautiful water tank, but they have no idea what it is and they have no idea what's in there. And they've only eaten off, the, you know, grazed off the ground or, or uh, by nursing their mama. They have no idea what a feed bunk is. And I said, I always said, if, uh, you know, if, if someone wanted to take the risk, I would take a calf that knows what a feed bunk is 
and uh, has been weaned for 60 days, knows what a feed bunk is and knows what a water tank is over a calf that's been vaccinated and, and just sent to me. Um, if they can get off that truck and recognize uh, where the feed is and where the water is, that's, that's probably 80% of the battle right there. Yeah. So I'm itching to get to the vaccine part because of so many different reasons. But before we do that, the last thing on the antibiotics that I want to touch on, and I feel like this is just as important on the dairy side as it is for the beef side, is that withdrawal period. Like people do not understand like the withhold period, withdrawal, whatever you want to call it and what that is. And that, you know, just because we're giving cows antibiotics, we're giving them, you know, they are prescribed by a vet. We're giving them only if they're needed. We've covered all of that. But then there is also the point that like those cattle are not just instantly turning around and entering our food supply system or their milk is not entering the food supply system. It is more complicated than that. And there's a lot of checks and balances in place. So maybe you could touch a little bit on what that looks like, you know, from, an, from the, um, you know, whether you're harvesting the animals or collecting the milk standpoint. Yeah. So <clears throat> Every drug that we administer to cattle, whether it's uh, to any livestock, whether it's an antibiotic or an anti-inflammatory, even vaccines, uh, have a withdrawal period. And that means that, let, let's say that a, an antibiotic has a 30-day withdrawal period. So if that animal is treated on May 1st, um, it cannot be presented for slaughter until after May 30th. That's, so that's 30 days. And it, it's just that simple. The, uh, the companies that make these antibiotics and vaccines and anti-inflammatories, whatever we inject into these animals, before that, those products are cleared by the FDA or the USDA. And I want to make this clear. Uh, the FDA clears antibiotics and anti-inflammatories and that sort of thing. Uh, it's the USDA that's in charge of clearing uh, animal vaccines. Uh, so just, just want to make that clear. But uh, these companies that, that make these products have to provide the research that shows that these animals uh, have reached an acceptable level of, uh, of residue in their meat. And, and a lot of sometimes that's zero. Um, Sometimes it's just a, a, an extremely low level that is incredibly hard to um, uh, measure. So um, th there is a withdrawal period. Um, feed yards and, and producers uh, observe those withdrawal periods. And that makes our meat safe and residue free when they, when they go to slaughter. Yeah, and it's similar with beef or it's similar with dairy as it is with beef, you know, that there's yes. a withdrawal period for milking the cow before that cow can come back into our milking herd that the, it is sold, you know, to the public. So very similar. Yeah. Go ahead, Natalie. Yeah, there, there, there is a milk withdrawal period. Uh, uh, there, most of them that, ha that are labeled for dairy cattle have both a meat withdrawal period and a milk withdrawal period where that milk has to be, the cows are still milked but uh, the milk is withheld and does not go into the bulk tank to be sold to for humans. What I wanted to say was to just further drive home the fact that, you know, Dr. Dave ended with it saying it is safe and to further drive that home after we have this withdrawal period that again is with upheld across the, you know, U S whether it's meat or milk um, when it comes to our food system, once that animal uh, specifically, I guess, talking um, the packer and it would be Tara, maybe you, I don't think it'd be much difference, but I'll use Packer terms. We talked in back in episode 65 with um, Dr. Jessica Fink, also from Merck, um, that even when it gets to that stage, they are still at that point testing and doing a swipe um, to assure again that there is none of the antibiotic, even on top of that withdrawal period. So to further drive home that safety issue, I do think, you know, as a U.S. food system as a whole, we are paying attention to, you know, the appropriate time and testing to make sure that none of that, those treatments, like you said, whether it's antibiotics or something else is entering into the food system. Yeah. And <clears throat> the USDA food safety inspection service, FSIS actually puts out a, a list every week of people who have violated or uh, residues they have mm -hmm. found. And, uh, and number one, it is uh, the, 
the, the percentage of carcasses that are found with, with any kind of residue in them is, is less than 1%, I mean, and way less than 1%. So they are out there policing it, making sure that the, the rules are being followed. And uh, uh, the, uh, but the, that repeat violators list is something anyone can have access to. Uh, it's it's kind of boring reading, but if you're <laughs> if you're really interested in it, uh, you can see that uh, uh, they're literally singling out producers who may have uh, uh, an issue with observing withdrawal times. So um, it's uh, it to me it's a uh, it's a good thing that it's out there. Um, I used to uh, actually get it sent to me every week and and go through it, but uh, it's number one. It's uh, like I say, it gets boring. Uh, it's not that not that long a list, and uh, which I guess, frankly, is a credit to our industry. You have yeah, and from too, so you're busy. <laughs> yeah. uh, so on the dairy side, I'll just mention briefly before we move into our next topic. But um, it's similar, like Natalie said, every single tanker of milk is tested before it leaves our farm. It's tested again at the plant. There is so many checks and balances in place. Um, But with that, I kind of want to move into the vaccine part of this. And we touched on this earlier, but I want to like reiterate how important this is, uh, that it's about prevention and management. And my husband will drive that home like that it is not, yes, antibiotics have their place, but if you can prevent it, like the virus or the bacteria infection from ever happening, that is crucial. And I know on the dairy side, this was actually something I studied my first year out of college was we did like a BRD study and you mentioned BRD, it's bovine respiratory disease. And if a cow, a calf gets BRD, gets like a respiratory uh, infection and if it's bacteria or if it's viral, her like lifetime is forever impacted on the dairy side. Like she will probably not produce as much milk. She will not be as healthy. And so prevention from that ever happening is absolutely crucial. And that really comes in with management practices and vaccinations. And so I think I want to start this with like vaccinations are such an important part of what we do and are really about the animal welfare and creating like a good healthy calf from day one. But let's be honest, right now, vaccines are making a big splash in the news for maybe the not the best thing. There's a lot of questions and concerns and conversations right now around mRNA vaccines. So let's start with, I guess, kind of like big picture there of like, do they exist? Are they being used? What do we need to know about the mRNA vaccines that everyone is talking about? Well, I think the first... Uh, thing that I, I want to say about this is right now, there are no, absolutely no livestock vaccines that use messenger RNA or better known as mRNA technology. It, there's there's none there. Um, does that mean that there never will be? I, I can't, I can't answer that. There, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there are uh, some attempts in the future that these products will be made. Um, unless, um, you know, there is enough public outcry, which, um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, there is no proof. Uh, the concern is that mRNA technology can alter human genetics when consumed as food. And there simply is no proof of that, none whatsoever. So we, we have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, uh, social media and, uh, and those sorts of things they never heard of it <laughs> yeah well <laughs> i actually i actually uh have not been on social media for a little over a year <laughs> just because of all the the a lot of, whether it's political hysteria or medical hysteria um it, it just it occupies a lot of time that i could be doing other things but uh uh but Unfortunately, it is it is such an awesome vehicle that is being misused, in my opinion. It, it can be it could be such a wonderful thing, but it isn't. But that's uh, I'll get off that the social media aspect of it. But uh, it is a uh, it is a the opportunities with uh, mRNA vaccine and and the benefits to it. Uh, in animal health and human health are are pretty impressive. 
uh, even though there are not, uh, again, I want to reiterate, there are no livestock vaccines that use mRNA technology, period. So, um, I really wouldn't want to tell anyone that we, uh, that they should not be developed for livestock. Uh, again, there, there is no evidence that it alters human genetics or human DNA in any way. And, uh, but, uh, I'm always, I've always encouraged my clients, my customers, uh, people I've worked with to, to question everything. So I think it's healthy to have the discussion. Um, and if we don't have the discussion, then there, there probably won't be as strong of an effort to prove that they, they are truly safe. Um, and as it stands right now, the tech, the, the research we have indicates that they are truly safe. Um, on that, Natalie, anything you want to add on the mRNA? Otherwise, I'm going to jump into just vaccines in general. Nope. I think we, you know, brought uh, Dr. Dave on for his expertise opinion and really to just kind of clear that up. And he did that. <laughs> Awesome. Well, then with that, I kind of want to move into like more specific, like more general vaccines, you know, how are they used? I know, you know, I think one of the things that is interesting about vaccines is they are used across the board, organic, conventional, like we are using them to be proactive and it is about animal health. So how are we using them and what are they doing to kind of benefit us as producers and ultimately for the animal? Well, proactive is an excellent word, I think, that you use there and, and that that's the that's the whole point of it is to uh, get ahead of any vaccine or any disease challenges that uh, your livestock may may have um, you know the uh, some of the issues that I, I would see in the feed yard um, come from either uh, no vaccinations or um, improperly vaccinating. And by that, I mean, uh, not, not getting a, a booster in and that sort of thing. Most of your modified live vaccines uh, do not require a, a booster. If you have a killed vaccine, if you use a killed vaccine, it does require a booster or you will not get uh, immunity, uh, true immunity. And, and really the simplest way to, if, if number one, it says on the label, whether it's modified live or killed, but as a general rule, if you have to mix a liquid with a dry cake, that is a modified live vaccine. If it's ready to uh, inject right from the bottle, that is a, a killed vaccine. That's a, just a real simple way of telling the difference between the two of them. And so um, if, you're, if you're using a killed vaccine, and you'd, again, you'd have to read the label on the particular product you're using, but most of them say that it... You, you give the initial dose and then two to maybe as long as six weeks later, get in the booster dose. Excuse me. If uh, with, with modified lives, again, I like to, uh, uh, if I was prescribing a preconditioning program for a beef producer, you know, I'd want a, uh, a modified live in those calves at around branding time uh, as far as the, the five uh, five virals. <clears throat> and then another one, uh, a couple of weeks before they, uh, actually take them off the cows and that would give a, a strong immune response. It, it will help the rancher as well, because it will help prevent disease while those cattle are being, uh, preconditioned. But again, usually along with those modified live vaccines comes killed vaccines. And, and again, a seven way clostridial is probably one of the more common ones or an eight way clostridial, depending on the region of the country you might be in. Uh, and, uh, but those, uh, those vaccines that are killed definitely needs to have two rounds to them, um, administered within a, a few weeks of each other. And, and that's the only way you're going to get, uh, true protection. Uh, it's, it's kind of disappointing when, uh, when, when we hear of, of producers that give, uh, think they're doing the right thing and they give a, a, a killed vaccine once and wean their calves and then what they vaccinated against uh, starts to infect those calves and they, and they just never followed up with the second dose. And 
uh, it's so important to have that second dose in those in those calves. And again, the, the whole goal there is is to prevent disease, not not treat disease. And that's you know that's good for antimicrobial stewardship um, and uh, and just animal welfare in general. The uh, and keep in mind that vaccines do have a withdrawal period. Most of the modified live vaccines are typically around uh, 21 to 28 days, and most of the killed are uh, 30 to as much as I've seen them as much as 60 days. But again, check the label for withdrawal periods on your vaccines. I'm not going to lie, coming into this conversation today with a vet and Natalie being a pharmacist, I feel very underqualified to be having this conversation. So I'll let, let Natalie, you want to take it away? I'll let you bring in your expertise. Well, it's funny because I was going to say I cannot, again, but help, and it's probably because of my pharmacy background, but help and just drive home the fact that it is so similar between humans and animals. Again, there's even live and non-live when it comes to human vaccines, you know, your shingles or your flu, like we give live and non-live to humans. And so I think if you're a proponent and advocate for modern medicine or vaccinations or antibiotic use as a human for yourself or your family or your loved ones, um, it extends in the same breath and manner to applying antibiotics and vaccines to animals. There really isn't a difference. So in my mind, it just, I just don't correlate or get how someone could, again, use medicine in their everyday life for themselves, but think it should not be used when it comes to treatment or prevention in our, um, in our animals. Well, and, and, you know, that's kind of the thing that, uh, that we use in the veterinary field with, uh, our, uh, when we talk about uh, calves coming into a feedlot is uh, if we compare them to children going to daycare or to kindergarten, um, you know, uh, there's, I mean, I, I watch my grandkids go to daycare and, and uh, the runny noses and, uh, and the flu and that sort of thing that goes around with them. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're doing the, a similar thing with, uh, with our cattle in the way we co-mingle them and, uh, and expose them to to each other from different farms, different ranches, different regions of the country. And again, you know, when a calf, when a load of calves comes into a feed yard, they might be penned right next door. They say they came out of Georgia, they might be penned right next door to a bunch of calves that came out of Oklahoma. So I mean, completely different regions of the country. And uh, and so uh, the the uh, daycare model is a, uh, is a good one to compare it to. Yeah. My husband always uses that one. He's always, you know, cat, we have our calves and hutches cause we're on a dairy. And he's like, if you've had your kid in a playpen and didn't want them, you know, licking the other kid next door, that is, it's very similar. We don't want our calves all like, you know, intermingling, mixing until they've kind of got that immune system built up. We've gotten them some vaccines. They've started, you know, working prevention. And then, yeah, when they move to that group uh, pen, it is like being in a kindergarten class, you know, they're kicking, <laughs> they're, you know, messing with each other, playing with each other. And, uh, and it, it all, you know, builds on their health and goes back to kind of that animal, animal welfare of getting them off to a good start before we move them to those group pens so that they can not be passing every runny nose to each other. Yep. Yep. Natalie, anything else you want to add? I don't think so. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's it for today. So thank you all for listening to Discover Ag, where every week we discover what's new in the world of agriculture. And we want to give a special thanks again to Merck Animal Health for uh, being a sponsor of this podcast. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dave, for coming on and sharing with our audience. This was extremely valuable, and I hope it puts a lot of questions and unrest at ease, like people know and feel can feel good about the decisions we're making for animals. So thank you so much, and we will see you guys next week. Thank you.